let's start with, uh, with you, Tricia, and I, I hope that some of the fellows will be uh, coming in as we uh, as we move along. Yes, I can see some of our fellows there. Hi, Elias, Albina, Titus, Kennedy. Uh, we're waiting for a couple more. I've got messages coming in going, I can't connect, but I'm sure they will <laughs> in a minute. Um, we all know that problem with connectivity. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm a senior associate with uh, Insight Share, And yeah, I also do a digital storytelling, which is a slightly different method. And I also work at Goldsmiths University of London. So I have a lot of hats, but today I'm on the uh, Living Cultures Indigenous Fellowship. That's my hat for today. Um, so I just want to give you a very brief overview of how the fellowship started and the methods we've been using to train remotely in also in remote parts of Africa. Uh, and this year, mainly, it, well, just in Kenya this year. Um, so I'll just give you, I'm doing something really short because I feel very strongly that the voices in this uh, session need to be those of the people who are using the techniques and who are passing their skills on to others in their communities. I don't want to sp speak for anyone or ventriloquize anyone or anything. So I'm just going to give you that little brief overview on what the fellowship is, where we got here and the kinds of methods we're using. And later on, if you have questions about that stuff, of course, we can bring that in. in. But I'm, I'm hoping that um, our fellows will enlighten you a little bit more about what they're actually experiencing through the remote training. And this year's group, particularly, they're in their second phase. So they're in the middle of their first PV process with their communities. So hopefully you'll get some uh, idea of how it actually feels as opposed to how it's supposed to feel, which is theoretical. They can tell you how it actually is. So I'm gonna to attempt to share my screen now. This is the moment that I get terrified. Oh, I'd have disabled screen sharing going on. Can I have permission to share the screen please? Is that okay? Otherwise I can't. Or I'll Definitely. Have to... um, <laughs> there, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay, so can you see this uh, pretty slide? Everyone, just let me know you can see it. I never trust it. Yes, you can, yes. brilliant. Yes. Uh, thank you for your lovely uh, design, which I've stolen a little bit to make uh, our front cover for our... Um, uh, slide presentation. So a little bit of history, two minutes worth. So in 2021, with the support of the Bertha Foundation and the Staples Trust, Insight Share launched the Living Cultures Indigenous Fellowship, which we saw as a strategy to deliver remote training to Indigenous peoples who want to harness participatory media as a tool for engaging and mobilizing their communities. And we particularly talking to our many, many partners from indigenous communities, we um, all agreed that indigenous, the indigenous youth and the cultural traditions that they belong to have much wisdom and experience to offer human society now in these critical times in every way you can imagine. But as we know, um, they remain the most marginalized and the least heard. So those little stats, 80%, you know, these 80% of the world's biodiversity is on indigenous lands, but indigenous peoples are often even criminalized and killed for protecting their territories. And these issues are compounded by the lack of access to communications technology, connectivity, low literacy, and I think maybe most importantly, the erosion of traditional languages and knowledge happening, chipping away bit by bit. So that's why we decided to set this up. Um, there, oops, there we go. So um, this is this is last year. So when we uh, kicked off uh, in 2021, um, one of the reasons we went remote, and it's not the only reason, but of course we had to because of the you know what, the pandemic. I wasn't gonna mention it, but it's there. Um, so we, you know, there was an absolute, like, if, if we don't do this, then everything goes dead for however long this is going to last. But we were meaning to do this anyway, because 
you know, truly flying people out and training people. And then, you know, it's just not sustainable and not a, a great way to do this. So we decided to try and flip to do online delivery of training, which is quite challenging when actually Insight Share, our practice is quite, um, what shall I say? We demonstrate a lot. We walk around the space a lot. We stick things on walls. We touch a lot you know I mean it's a physical thing that we do when we're doing um, participatory video training so the idea of going into a zoom environment like we are in now was just how are we going to do this and kind of retain that kind of essence of who we are and what our practice is around participatory video and our kind of training culture as well which is our training culture is each one teach one so we are always trying to share between the group maybe show once and then we step back and everyone helps each other, which is quite hard to do on a Zoom kind of situation when, you know, you're absolutely kind of dominating the space if you're the trainer because of the little boxes. We can't walk around and do that. So anyway, I will I will tell you how we came up with some methods, which we're still testing now um, in a moment. So these are the communities that we work with in the first phase. My fantastic colleague, Sabine Hellman, really, she was the, the pioneer of setting this, you know, developing these first resources. And I think, I know she did a great presentation, maybe it's a year ago now for, for you guys. So rather than uh, repeat what she did, because you can probably see it if it's recorded, I just wanted to capture a little bit about you know, what she pioneered and the fact that we actually worked in all these communities that you can see on this map here um, in that first um, iteration of the fellowship programme. We also work closely with our local partner, PALCA, the Pan-African Living Cultures Alliance. And I'm hoping that Amos, who uh, set that up, um, is going to be online with us fairly soon. And I think Scholar's now online and she can tell you a little bit about that too. Um, so we looked at online working as a way to facilitate access, but it's also a challenge because of connectivity, instability, cost of data, and even what we've just seen when trying out the tech, you know, it's not always um, stable and so on and so forth. So a couple of little results from... Whoops, stage one. So here you can see that we, in the first iteration, the first year, we trained 38 youth. Um, we trained 18 women from six communities in four countries. And this was very important to us to go to these, to some of the most remote places. And we had relationships with all of these groups before. We didn't just kind of jump in and go, hey, do you want to do this? We we had relationships already and actually consulted whether this would be a great thing to test out or not. We didn't impose it. It was very much a collaborative decision to fundraise to do this and then test it out. And we can you can see a little image of last year's, some of last year's participants in the circle there. And in the bottom left, you can see um, some of the mentors from um, last year um, who are still working with us this year. And I think hopefully both Amos, who is the third on the top right in the black and white images, and Magella, who's in the middle there and the bottom images should be joining us today if they're not ready already with us. So um, in the first year, um, there were three phases over nine months, it was quite flexible. Each week had one session, um, one day a week they would work together and we would check in once a week via Zoom or WhatsApp or whatever was working best in terms of connectivity. So this year, we've kind of focused a little bit. Um, you can see we've added two more hubs, both in Kenya with the Sengwe and the Ogyek communities. I'm sorry if I haven't positioned the orange dot in quite the right place. It's I couldn't quite get it there with the map, but it's more or less in the right place. Um, and I'm gonna leave it to Sengwe and Ogyek 
colleagues who are online and I'm going to bring them in to tell you more about their communities and why they have joined the fellowship and why they think it's important after we've been through these slides. Um, so it's we we equip each hub with um, basic production equipment. Um, we go for phones. That's a deliberate choice because it keeps it affordable and accessible. And even though not everyone has phones, a lot of people do have phones with the capability of taking pictures and shooting video. So it doesn't limit it to having one kit stuck away in an office somewhere that you can't access unless you're having a training session or whatever. Um, and you can, you can see here, um, the kind of rig that they're using. There's a kind of a, a rig that they can put it on a tripod. And we also um, use filming apps. This time we've been using Filmic Pro to kind of up the quality a bit of filming on foam, f foams, phones even, and give that sense that you're selecting, you know, the high definition and, and it has various functions on it that bring you a step beyond just using a phone on a mobile uh, a, a camera on a mobile phone um, because it has those um, possible um, more professional selections that you can make and also enables you to really monitor the sound and so on and so forth. So um, that's what we've been using. And whoops, sorry, I keep doing that. I'm running between two screens. And every time I come back to this screen, I press the button twice by accident. That's why I keep doing that. Anyway, okay. this is the right slide. Um, so here we have um, this year's kind of overview of um, what the fellowship has looked like. So the first phase, July to September, we did an introduction to participatory video how we learn the equipment, but how we also share our skills between each other. So the, the, the participants were learning not only how to work things, but also how to teach each other how to use the equipment, how to experiment with shot types, all, all the things you would expect in a kind of introduction to filmmaking, but with the added kind of um, injection of um, how would you use this with your community, et cetera. And then from September to October, we said, OK, off you go. And we set them a community assignment in which they had to make three films in the community. One was a kind of a how to do an instructional kind of video. Another one was issue based and another one was drama based. So, again, these were training films, but to get them to be able to explore without the weekly piling on of more new things to get them explore the tools that they'd already got to grips with and try out some different techniques. And then the third phase here, or it's second phase, phase two, we started in October and we're just coming to an end now. And I will leave it to my colleagues to tell you more about yeah. that. So um, they are now transferring in how do we facilitate? It's not just how do we make films about, but how do we pass our skills on and bring people we're making films about into the production process? So that's the kind of stage we're at now, and they're in that stage now. So um, just quickly, how did we do that remotely? We use a kind of a flipped classroom approach. These are all the tools. So um, each week or most weeks, especially in the training phases, you'll see there's a WhatsApp thread on the left there where I'm sending links to videos of various exercises for them to learn how to do. And then in the middle, you'll see their links to YouTube. So they're looking at the videos. And then there's on the right there, you'll see a kind of PDF they can um, download, which are the written instructions as well. And then they photograph and document what they do and send them back to me. And then we have a check-in session online, which you can see on the bottom there, where I feed back and we chat about what works and what didn't and so on. That's how we're doing it remotely. Okay. So that's uh, kind of it from me. Um, I have no idea how long that was. Probably gone. You over. did. Uh, you went a little bit over time, Tricia, but it's fine. So we'll skip the video and just go straight to the to the fellows, and then let's let's hear their experiences. Yes, thank you. Okay, so I'm just seeing who we have. Um, ah, great, quite a lot. So 
I wanted to um, just introduce you to our this year's fellows um, and also to, I can see Scholar online there who was who has been with Insight Share for quite a long time. But first of all, let me go first to the Sengware Hub. Elias, can you maybe first introduce yourself and say a little bit of something about um, <coughs> community and what you're doing? Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, good evening. Uh, yes, I'm Elias Kimayo from Sengware Indigenous Community who are living in Cherangani Hills in in Emberwood Forest. So, we are an indigenous, and also I work as a director of uh, an organization known as Sanguary Indigenous Community Trust. So, I'm glad to be in this meeting. So, without taking much time, I think a um, uh, uh, feature for change has come for the right time for communities like ourselves who have been struggling for a length of time in their own spaces without their story being told by themselves. So most of the time, since colonial time to, to around this time that people tell stories about uh, indigenous communities uh, without them telling their own stories. And I think uh, Future for change has come at the right time so that to help equip uh, communities with knowledge to tell their own stories the way people want to learn about them. So uh, we got introduced uh, to Insight by Insight Share in I myself have been taking photographs around in the forest of House Hispanics and um, other human right related human rights violations, but I tell them to cities far away from here for people to wait in for, for me and also to show to the wider society what we are going through. But uh, sometimes those um, information is gets distorted because other people are reporting about it. Then in 2019, I think uh, I was uh, I, I was taken to South Africa by Inside Shia to go and learn uh, future for change, but especially future for change. And that is was the first time that I got introduced to this. And until 20 until 2022 is when now we came up with an app, Sengwer app whereby we are the good uh, facilitator by uh, uh, inside Chia, uh, Teresa, of course, and Dania, and, uh, and, and the third team, which was, uh, we did it remotely. First of all, as we were introduced to them, those people were learned that uh, they expanded from us uh, through, 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 through Palka, Pan-African Living Cultural Alliance, whereby Amos is sitting on it and the other fellow members. So we had a physical meeting in rotation of it, and then later on now we land it remotely. Of which now we are on our stage whereby we need to produce our first videos and the two community screen. In our view is that the uh, community have embraced it because they, they are part and parcel of uh, video processing. And I think uh, in uh, moving forward is that as a community, we will be equipped to tell our own stories. So that is it. And I'm so thankful for Insight here and also Palka for introducing us to these tools that we on ourselves as a community. So we are looking forward also to expand to as much as many, many people within our community and also uh, extend to other indigenous communities who are facing the same challenges and going the, to, uh, going the same struggles that we go as Sengwer. So I think that is what I can say for now. 
Thanks, Elias. That's brilliant. Um, we have um, only a few minutes before we switch to the next presenter who's got an awesome thing. So can I ask quickly, Kennedy, can you say something about Nakuru in two minutes to add to Elias? And also, um, Albina, I wanted you to say a little bit of something about why, as a woman, why, why are you finding this method important for you? Is that OK? Thank you. Kennedy, can you do that? Yes, uh, good afternoon, or I don't know, good morning. Uh, so my name is Kennedy Kipngeno. I'm from the Ogie community of Mao Forest. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we got to learn the, about the participatory video training through uh, uh, our director for Ogie People's Development Program, uh, who connected us to Nick and uh, we managed to join uh, the training, and uh, that is last year in April when we went to Loiter Hills, where we interacted with Toilet Lema Hub. Uh, that's when uh, we agreed to participate because we realized that uh, this training is important in sharing uh, our experience as indigenous community. So uh, I'm the mentor of uh, Nakuru Ogiek Hub, and uh, this PV uh, training is going to help us in uh, uh, increasing the visibility of uh, OGA community issues. Uh, foremost, uh, as concerning uh, our land rights struggle, uh, in our struggle to secure Mao Forest, uh, we, are, uh, we are going to use uh, PV for advocacy purpose and uh, sharing to the world uh, and also uh, we won a case in the African court uh, where the African court uh, declared uh, Mao as indigenous home for the Ogie community. And uh, we intend to use PV to support uh, the implementation of the case and to make other indigenous communities learn about land through us, about uh, land struggle, and also to, uh, to document more about our community issues with culture, identity, among many other things that uh, we, it's relevant to success of our community and other indigenous community across Kenya, across Africa, and globally. So I think most of the issues have uh, been said by Elias, whom we work closely, uh, because uh, the Ogiek and the same were at both hunter communities uh, or forest communities in Kenya. So. I want to say thank you for that. Thanks, Kennedy. Egbert, I think we have a time issue. Yeah, we, we but it doesn't matter because we have a general discussion at the end. But I think it's important now that, that we've, we've, you've shared the examples from the, the, the fellowship program there in, in Africa with Inside Share. Let's uh, go over to Sitten, Cambodia. And uh, let's document Cambodia. Um, same pattern. Sitten will explain a little bit about the general program and we'll hear from a few of the fellows. And then I think we still have plenty of time, Tricia, to have a discussion and also uh, hear from the other uh, fellows. And Andrew, your question is noted. We're also taking that up uh, at the end around the deep engagement. So um, now we're moving to Sitten. Um, good evening to you. In, uh, in Cambodia, um, take it away. Hi everyone, uh, this good evening from Cambodia. So it is uh, 7.30 <laughs> p.m. here. So yes, uh, I work at Sunflower Film Organization. So it's been founded uh, since uh, 2019. Our main mission is to train Cambodia youth, that include, which includes indigenous uh, people in filmmaking. So uh, we start off with uh, uh, the training of uh, provincial youth, but later on in uh, yeah, 2021, yeah, uh, and um, my program manager and our program coordinator, Wuthi, who is not here, but Wuthi is here. And I uh, came to a uh, realization that uh, we should narrow down our uh, target group. We cannot just uh, train uh, Cambodian youth because, yeah, they, they, 
they they have some advantages uh, over the filmmaking uh, yes access already so uh, we brainstorm on the vulnerable groups uh, to benefit from our skills and uh, resources and then uh, we realize uh, the group we need to uh, target is the indigenous communities uh, we thought about how uh, to uh, um, give this access to them and then uh... Sitin, you you went on mute Sitin, uh, maybe there is a, a problem with the, the connection. Yeah, you were just okay. saying that it's important to give access to indigenous youth. Please continue. Yes. Here's the thing, uh, we, uh, we got the advantages in the mainstream Cambodia, but uh, we need more uh, of this advantage provided to the indigenous communities. I also told uh, my colleagues that uh, the other organizations have done this already, like Bopana Center. I believe some of you might hear about this organization. So uh, we still stick to this decision of uh, the indigenous communities because we have different models. So our model is very intensive. So we started off in 2021, uh, training youth in uh, and Kachet provinces. So uh, those are the provinces uh, home to indigenous communities. So the model uh, was to train them in uh, 10 days, three days in class, uh, three days in shoot, outdoor shoot, and then they need to come back to class for the editing for four days. And after that, yeah, the projects were all locked. And then, yes, we just polished the documentaries and we showcased them in our own festivals. And then uh, later that year, we realized, okay, Maybe it was too intense for them. So uh, we had another idea, which, uh, which was to uh, deepen their skill by uh, getting them here in Phnom Penh. And uh, so, so the idea was to train them here for three months. And uh, in the three months, they learn, uh, they learn at home. But it, 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 it was a how we read it for them living together and together so, uh, them who is here so uh, one of whom one was from uh, international film festival like I don't know if you heard about him so the last film uh, that earned him uh, so believe that this skill can be handed down uh, from yeah Cambodian professional to indigenous uh, youth so that was how uh, Sokni uh, was recruited into the program and uh, the output of the program was to produce three documentaries uh, with uh, their well, housemate or well co-participants so uh, I believe some of you might have seen uh, the uh, submit documentary "Our Forest, Our Land." So I hope <laughs> you understand what uh, we tried, uh, what she tried to uh, address. So maybe you can talk to her more about uh, her experience. And uh, I, yeah, that's it. I don't have any presentation. I just want, <laughs> yeah, share what we went through, and then uh, I hope for more questions from all of you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Sitin. And maybe Sokni, uh, as you, you, you mentioned her, uh, maybe you can you talk a little bit about your experience uh, of, of joining um, Let's Document Cambodia. Okay, Jumdepsu. Hello, everybody. Hey, my name is Sitin Sokni. I am a poor indigenous group from Posat province and uh, in uh, Cambodia. I am a membership of uh, Cambodia Indigenous Women Association. Yes, I am. I am one, the sixth fellow of Doctor Club in 
implement by sunflower uh, film organization. Very uh, thank you for uh, Mr. Somsitan for inviting me to sharing about my experience. Uh, yes, and uh, first I very uh, interest in uh, Dr. Sugar Lab because of my experience to write educational song for indigenous people, but no, no one could help me. Second, the indigenous people have faced many problems such as land issue, environment issue, human rights and rape case. So I need a documentary video to advise, advocate bit better to our stakeholder for their intervention. Okay. Um, after workshop, I can help my community uh, to make document with my partner. Uh, up the time told the, uh, uh, there, uh, our land, our food. The video describes some issue of the uh, women who live in, sorry, sorry, error my, to hear me? We can hear you clearly, Sokni. After call, I produce a new music video and uh, we make an uh, audience understand meaning better. And speci especially, I hope my fellow villagers are in this man from uh, my hometown, he live with the uh, disability after uh, migration from Thailand. I uh, personally uh, made a video to raise fun to him. To him. Uh, I used my phone and edit with my computer uh, to uh, produ product. Okay. Second, my future goal, uh, I want to build a, a, a foundation to support education for indigenous uh, children and students of vulnerable people. However, this stream need video skill to pro produce uh, documentaries. Plus, I love being an artist and want to produce more music video to benefit and support my dream. Okay, thank you. That's all. Thank you so much, uh, Sokni. I, I have one additional question. You, you said that was interesting. You you managed to make a video of, yes. of someone. Uh, uh, Mr. Who... Ten can uh, want me, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Help me, okay. Okay, yeah, but just the question around the, 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 the was a person with disabilities and through your video you managed to raise funds. Can, can you say a little bit how that went? Like where did you distribute or where did you place that video and, and how did it um, get such a response um, in, the, in the context of, of where you were living? How did that work? Uh, ជួយជួយវិធានមួយនឹងជួយជួយវិធានមួយអឺអ្នកពីការហ្នឹងជនពីការហ្នឹងថាវាយ៉ាងម៉េចបានបានអាចវាជោគជ័យក្នុងការផ
Yes, it all started from her caring about her own villagers. So, uh, yes, she uh, keeps traveling between Phnom Penh and her home village in Phu province. That's another province, yeah, uh, inhabited by uh, indigenous people. So just to be precise, she is from a poor indigenous groups. Yeah. So they live uh, mostly in post -apples. So uh, as you see, see that uh, this suburb man living a very poor life, uh, she, yes, nurtures this sympathy for uh, his situation. And he, and he, he was not born disabled. He was disabled or imputed by uh, his, Thai boss after his migration. Mm. So uh, that uh, even made her more uh, emotional, uh, so emotional that she decided to make uh, that uh, video about part of his life and share it uh, online. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, this video earned the uh, interest or sympathy from uh, yes online users. Yeah, uh -huh. she didn't rest much, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, he got the attention. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, to uh, support his life uh, from the money she was. Yes. Yeah. Okay. ສໍາລວນລະເພີຕະນາຈະເອີ້ມີໃນຕະຈະລັບໄດ້ກໍອາດຍິງສູນກາງກຸຍຫຼືກໍເກງໃຫ້ມາໄດ້ກໍອາດ
So I've been working in Sarawak on and off for um, over you know, about 30 years. And we decided that we would create one final uh, participatory work with a group of um, Indigenous uh, folks in um, uh, Upper Bengo, just outside of Kuching. So these are people that have won a very, very complicated land rights dispute. Um, that dispute was won around 2014. And in the intervening period, they decided that they would um, utilize this opportunity to create a new form of generating income. And that, that uh, largely um, entailed a kind of um, a kind of form of uh, you know ecological tourism, but it hasn't really worked out that well for 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 many of the people on the ground, um, particularly for the women who, um, from my friends and colleagues who work with the communities, are saying that uh, they're really wanting to um, to change the way that they that they that that they've um, engaged with the broader community and to redefine what it means to be an indigenous community in this particular area. And so we thought about, and hence my question, you know, where does where does the origin or where does the impetus of, of participatory video come from? Yeah. Um, so obviously in the Cambodian context that we've been hearing from Sithan and um, Cian, um okay that um that it's 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 actually coming from 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 this from this community and they're seeking um expertise and they're seeking uh you know a, a platform a distribution platform and so forth whereas um in in, in sarawak we've produced a number of participatory projects very much in the way that you know the, the formula that the Trisha has, 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 has evolved in. But in, in this instance, um, we're finding a, a whole range of complexities in that um, people are less interested in telling their story because a younger generation is less interested in knowing the traditions of their, of their past. And they seem to be more interested in um, accruing wealth and um, purchasing you know the latest mobile phone um, the best you know and loudest stereos and uh, you know the 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 greatest and latest new motorbike and uh, so on and so forth so th there's this swerve away from um, the values that uh, that uh, um, myself and my colleagues and uh, the people that we've met in in communities throughout Sarawak over 30 years has, has has drifted and so we're bringing in this this idea of I think it's important or we feel it's important that um, that uh, that that stories are recorded um, for forthcoming generations that might 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 want to know what what um, what had transpired beforehand but we're yeah. hitting this kind of we're kind of hitting this uh, sort of cultural um malaise in a, in a way and the, the 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 other the other issue that we're finding is that the that the men folk in the community are more inclined to push their view of what needs to be told as opposed to approaching the women in the community. And we really want to know what the women have to say, because the word on the ground is that the women are becoming stronger and more um, adept at community organizing. Um, okay. So yeah, it's it's a complex situ situation. And, uh, yeah. and so uh, my question is, is, is trying to understand how do we how do we work in this in this in this uh, environment where um, there are sort of the, these competing tensions where young people are being are drifting towards a social media engaged um, aspirational um, goal, which seems strange 
in a very remote community where um, to get anywhere requires significant effort. Um, and yet you have um, uh, an aging community that doesn't have the, the agency, so to speak, to, um, you know, they want their young, their youth to be, um, to have a better life than, than yeah. what they had. And, and we're observing this from the outside, but we also don't want to impose our view. You know, so how do we how do we how do we create this? Um, how do we, how do we how do we do this? You know, it's it's a it's an entirely different scenario now than yeah. it had been say 20, 20 years ago. Okay, I'm sorry. I'll cu I'll cut you there. Sorry, Andrew. Thank you very no, much. I think you you hmm. you've beautifully sketched the dilemma that that you are facing, and and you also uh, mentioned uh, you know relevant questions. I think Scola, uh, as a woman, uh, a PV facilitator, um, you must have encountered this in your community as well. Does does it resonate? What Andrew is saying that that some of the values that the younger generations have are not necessarily in line with what say the traditions are or what you maybe as a, as a, as a facilitator would like to see and, and how do you tackle those, those challenges and, and, and also about the, the men sometimes being more dominant. Um, and, and hi again, Scola, good to see you again after so many years. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Scola uh, from Kenya. Uh, uh, southern part. Uh, uh, as a facilitator, I just want to uh, talk a little bit about the Maasai women and some of the challenges that uh, we are facing. But uh, thanks, uh, because we have a participatory video, which has been a weapon to us because uh, we have been, uh, we have, it has helped us to speak our voices as women and also uh, to send uh, uh, some awareness to different parts of our community and also to reach many people in, in one perspective way, uh, that is a participatory video. So uh, just the end of last year, uh, we started a project concerning uh, uh, women's rights. Uh, we have a big challenge as our uh, as Maasai community. Women and uh, uh, girl child are really passing through a very difficult process that is FGM, uh, the cut, which is uh, something that is uh, being uh, uh, stood against by different people and uh, many people around the world. So through PV, we are trying to raise awareness. We are trying to uh, reach different people uh, from our community uh, to reach to interior places. Uh, where we can reach by ourselves, we can go there, visit them physically, but uh, mostly we are using PV. We have been documenting uh, uh, several clips, uh, videos concerning FGM, the negative effects that are facing uh, a person or facing a girl child, the problem that will be caused by the cut, some challenges that will be brought by through the cut. And uh, we thank because at least we have reached many people and we are still going to reach many people because we are still going for the second round. We have just finished our first round where we have documented uh, five participatory videos. Uh, we have five locations and now we are just on the process of starting to go uh, screening to all the five videos and making a general clip where, where, whereby we will uh, take information and feedbacks from the five locations. And then from there, we will uh, come again and bring together all the five locations, uh, people uh, from all the location, both men and women, because uh, uh, women are affected and also men are aware of the effect that women are passing. So we have to involve both sex so that at least we can get a solution from the both sides. Because if they come with a, one agreement to forget about the cut 
and to leave the card, then it will be fine because now it is an agreement of uh, uh, all both sides, not only one side. And uh, as, the, as the community, men are the head of the family and the, they are the decision makers. So they have to agree in one move that they are going to uh, leave uh, the cut uh, forever. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate to be part of this uh, discussion as we speak about our the problems and how we solve them through participatory video. Thank you so much. Thank you, Scola. And, and just quickly to, to ask Andrew's uh, question. Eh? You say the men are the decision makers. Eh? You have to involve them, otherwise things don't move along. But do you agree that the women tend to be, or at least is that true in your community, the better organizers? Uh, that that make more things happen, or or is or isn't that that that, that, a, that a, a thing in in your community? Scola. Yes. Repeat, please. Uh, I oh. I was thinking you are talking to Robert. <laughs> oh no no no! I'm not talking to a robot. I'm trying to talk to you. It's it's okay. it is always weird sitting in a room looking at a screen and talking. Eh? It's a, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it's a weird reality. Okay. Andrew okay. mentioned that in his work in Sarawak, which is uh, in indigenous community, so that is in in Southeast Asia. Uh, yeah. He noticed there's a trend that women start to become better and better and more equipped at community organizing. Um, compared to the men. And, and, and you said that, well, the men are the decision makers in, in the communities you work with. So you have to involve the men, otherwise, you know, things don't move along. But, but how about that role of community organizing? Is, is that also a development you see in, in the communities you work with, that, that women are getting more and more equipped on taking on those roles? Or they have yeah, always thank been? You. Thank you so much. Yeah, in our community, as I have said, uh, in in the family life, men are the head of the family and they are also the decision makers. Although at the moment we are in a digital world, we are in the world whereby women are also being involved in many discussions. So for us to capture this thing from the bottom and to uproot it completely from the community, we have also to include men in the discussion. We have to make them also understand the uh, disadvantages of the cut and the effect that the cut can bring in our lives as girls and women. Because if we ourselves, women can go and say that we don't want a cut, then it will not be complete until the all circles agree that the cut is, is not uh, good at all. So yeah, in the organization like now, the Voice of Ma, where I am working uh, at the moment as a facilitator, are women like myself, I can speak in the voice, in women voice, the women can be heard, the women can, can be listened. But as I have said, we have also to include men so that everything will be complete, the circle will be complete. So women are not behind, they are not left behind, but we have also to include men. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Scola, for that nuanced answer. And, and it's great to see a, a bit of the, the reality that, that you are working with. Amos, I see you're raising your hand. Um, <laughs> maybe you have a question or you would like to contribute to the discussion. Go ahead, Amos, and good to see you again. Yeah, thank you so much, Egbert. Uh, I miss you long. I'm sorry, I, I struggled to join for a long time. So I miss part, many part of the discussion because of our signals, they are very weak. So I'm sorry everyone for coming late, but I have tried to follow up the discussion from our brothers from Cambodian and I'm really pleased and inspired by their story. So thank you so much. And I'm really, really moved. Uh, just to uh, put some input about what my sister said, there is a lot uh, of work to be done uh, and in, our, in our part. Uh, but this part of the video have really helped us to pass a message to our community, uh, especially the use of the voice, the, fo the, the voice of the youth has been added 
as a result of participatory video. And in particular to what uh, scholars say about uh, giving information in terms of female genital uh, mutilation or cutting, we are able to pass the message in a way that is respectful to the community, in a way that the community understand. But uh, as you say that men has a lot of voice, it doesn't mean that uh, the women in the Maasai community are not really contributing. I can say major work is done by women and their contribution in, in society is very huge. And uh, so for that, uh, I just want to support her that the women contribution in terms of community building is very huge and even uh, family support. So uh, in our cases, Oltelo Lema Kenya, a participatory video have really built us to pass a message to the community toward uh, abandonment of FGC. And it also helps sharing with the youth in terms of social media, because many of the youth are in the social media. And this platform of uh, participatory video have engaged the youth a lot in advocating for the change they want. So even in terms of environment, the youth have been able to use the PV to address. There is an issue of the road, which it was forced to pass through the forest. Uh, we come in as Oldo Lema Kenya. We share with the youth in the social media platform our voice, and they really put a lot of voice in terms of uh, expressing their feelings. So I can say the youth in Ma, uh, Maasai community have been able to use the platform or uh, uh, social media through PV to address uh, what they are feeling. So I can say that uh, we are really uh, the beneficiary. And since the start of uh, PV, in, in Maasai community because we are the leader, we are the first group to initiate that. We have really seen a change. Although we are growing very small because we are a young organization which is growing, but our impact has been felt as a result of participatory video. So thank you so much. Uh, we feel really uh, great because of inside share because they are our major supporters they have been supporting us to ensure that uh, indigenous people voice is raised up. So uh, we are grateful for that. And uh, as a result, I am so much inspired by what our brothers from Cambodia are saying. They are able to inspire change as a result of this participatory video. So yeah. I am saying that participatory video is now, is showing that it's giving community to build one another. So we learn from uh, them, they learn from us and in the aspect of communication. So thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so much inspired. Thank you so much, Amos, for, for sharing that. And I'm really noticing that it's such an inclusive, eh? everybody can take part, everybody can express through participatory videos. So once these skills are in a community, the sharing, the, the recording of other voices, the ongoing discussions is really something that is triggered by this. And that is very inspiring to hear. And I see that is, that is common both in, in the Cambodian cases that we've heard and, and from the, the Kenyan cases we've just heard. Dennis, I see you are also raising your hand. Do you have a question or would you like to add something to the discussion? Go ahead, uh, Dennis. Hello, Dennis? I think Dennis is, is having a problem um, with his or her connection. Um, so maybe Trisha, I see you're, you're raising your hand. Maybe we'll go to Trisha first and then we'll go back to you, Dennis. And hopefully by then, um, and I see more people raising their hands. Okay, so <laughs> let's get the discussion going. Trisha, you first, and then we go back to Dennis if it works. And then we go to Titus. Go ahead, uh, Trisha. We started a trend. Just quickly, Andrew, I will come back to you on the question you asked ages ago. Um, but I wanted to ask um, one thing about uh, Albina. Uh, you put somewhere in the chat, you put something around the use of... Um, of PV, particularly for women in your community, especially for using the mother tongue, which I think is really important. So I just wanted to nudge you a bit to say something about that. But I also wanted to ask a question about the difference between a PV practice and other kinds of practices and why use a participatory approach as opposed to just making a film. 
So there's that's two things. One is nudging Albina, and the other is a more general question out there for discussion. Albina? Hi, everyone. Nudge, Hello, nudge. I was sharing... Hello. <laughs> Hello, I was sharing a bit about the women, same women who are eager to learn about the but part of the video because the <coughs> the video itself, the tool itself is not biased, it can encourage them to use their own language to pass the information. Mostly the issues affecting them, like a fiction. So it is an encouraging tool. <coughs> okay. Hello. Oh. Okay. oh, go on, go on. Okay. So though some of them are shy to look directly into the camera, but I'm trying my best to help them discuss what the issues and what is the importance of speaking directly to the camera. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Albina, for, for, for clarifying that, that a little bit. Um, Dennis, can you try again to unmute and see if we can now hear you? Dennis? No, I'm, I'm really sorry, uh, Dennis. We, we still can't hear you. Maybe you can uh, try and use the chat. I, I saw you wrote there's a technical glitch, uh, but we can't hear you at the moment. But we'll, we'll, we'll try and come back to you at a later stage. Maybe try and, and, and fiddle a bit with your microphone or some of the settings. Um, but for the moment, uh, we'll move on to Titus. Titus uh, Kamboy. Um, go ahead, Titus. Hi, everyone. Uh, through VPF, we are plan uh, we are planting a lot as a community, and uh, more so in terms of information, uh, catering, uh, interpretation, also funding between us, uh, the members of, of uh, the community from Taifas uh, sub uh, counties. Because here in Kenya we have uh, we are in three counties: Elkeo Marakwet, uh, Transoia, and West Fokot. But through PP, we have uh, uh, united our community. We have made a bonding between us ourselves, and we have shared a lot. And the diverse uh, skills and knowledge that we have uh, incorporated our members has met as a stepping stone because the message that we are passing through to our members uh, through uh, PP has enabled us to make a good progress in terms of land struggle, um, representation, democracy, and smooth uh, functioning of our society and uh, also uh, transmission of heritage and uh, cultural values. So it is uh, more important for us to participate fully and share with uh, diverse communities around the world like Cambodia. Uh, and I have a question to our members uh, in the group from Cambodia side that uh, how do they uh, go about because they have uh, they are indigenous communities like us in Kenya and uh, they are also a best uh, land struggle challenge. How do they uh, shape democracy and uh, smooth functioning using uh, these platforms? I would uh, hear as a Sanguari member uh, that uh, how do they uh, go about until the are uh, when they are pursuing their land uh, struggle. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Titus. Uh, Sitan, I think we can uh, pass that question to you. Eh? So about the land struggles, do, 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 do the indigenous communities you work with face those as well? And how do they go about it? Do they manage to, to get the democratic system going or is there a, a different way uh, to go about this in Cambodia? Uh, go ahead, Sitan. Oh, yes. Uh, that's a very relevant question because uh, our, the documentary we like you to, to uh, watch is 
uh, subtly uh, addressing that issue. So we title it "Our Land, Our Food" uh, in such a way, in such an indirect way that uh, we need before you do everything on our land, you need to know what the consequence will be. So, uh, so that will be that will affect our food, something like that. So. Uh, Last year, when uh, we went to scout the location uh, in the uh, indigenous village of Kampong Tom province, I ran into that accident, well, by myself. It was not even an accident, it was planned for. So uh, the community leader uh, had the, her land uh, grabbed by a, a so-called development company. So she tried to solve it uh, like peacefully, and it was uh, settled for a few weeks, especially after we left uh, uh, her village uh, back, and then we came back to Phnom Penh to yes, repair all our equipment. But uh, a few weeks before we went back to shoot our documentaries in that uh, village, we were told that uh, she was arrested. So, so everyone, including me here, she, she asked me this question. Uh, are we going to shoot over there? Will, uh, would the authority, uh, uh, I mean, attack us or arrest us like her? And then, yeah, I tried to solve it in, well, my diplomatic way, like, okay, let's just uh, re uh, file a request to the uh, provincial administration and uh, act as if nothing happened. <laughs> and then they kind of gave us the green light because we didn't say anything about, uh, I mean, that communi community leaders arrest because our goal was to shoot the documentaries and to train our indigenous participants. And the accident happened uh, just in a bad timing, I would say. That's why uh, at our organization, some sort of female uh, organization, we tend to adopt uh, the soft or subtle approach. So remember what uh, I told you in that private on signal. Now it can be publicized. So we tend to go subtle. Uh, we want to address an issue, but not in a, an aggressive way or advocate for, I mean, uh, openly. Uh, for those rights. So we use the documentaries to tell the stories of uh, the affected people. So I would say doc other documentary makers would uh, rely on the, the, the hard advocacy, like, okay, the activists, that I understand, but uh, that is not our principle here. Yeah. And I, uh, we just don't keep them from doing that. It's their rights as well. So, uh, we just treat yeah. the, the land grabbing issue differently. I, I hope I an, uh, I answer you, uh, Titus, right? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, Sidan. Yeah, and then I can give a little bit of context in Cambodia. Just uh, recently, uh, an independent media outlet, its license was taken away from it by uh, the, the government in in Cambodia because they were indeed not subtle. Uh, in, in some of the comments. Well, there's a lot of debate on, on, on how that went, but that is a, a reality in, in Cambodia that your license can be um, revoked uh, and then and then you, you, you can't uh, publish uh, things anymore. And, and sit in on Trisha's question, and then we'll go to Kazu uh, Ahmed. Um, just what Trisha mentioned about the difference between just making a documentary and doing PV, um, you, you seem to say, there was a documentary, but a certain style, a certain, a certain non-confrontational, peaceful uh, way. Yeah? Does PV also tend to have that kind of process, or, or, or do you see advantages between using PV and, 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 and making a documentary? Or could you speak to that a little bit? And then we'll, we'll go to Kazoo. Yeah, sit in. Uh. Ah, okay. Um, I think uh, everything we have here is all medians to something to achieve a certain goal. So uh, 
I would say PV uh, is a very, I mean, very convenient tool for uh, every filmmaker. <laughs> That's how I see it. <laughs> That's how I got interested in uh, inside share practices. <laughs> like, okay, uh, maybe uh, if we don't rely on heavy equipment, we could be doing the same. <laughs> like just use the mobile phone and document things. Uh, yes. However, uh, the difference here, we, we like to uh, professionalize uh, our participants. I'm not saying that uh, PVs are not professional. I'm just saying that uh, we like to upgrade their skill to, uh, to at least be semi-professionals. And that's a, a, a hidden agenda in Sunflower Film Organization. Uh, we want to professionalize our beneficiaries. Uh, other organization would use the videos or films or documentary just as their communication or awareness tool. We don't mind about that, but it's just that, well, it's not our priority. We, we want our participants to go further in their career or even their, their I don't know, thematization or issues. So that's how we want to uh, push the challenge a little bit. But I understand that, uh, yeah, with all the constraints um, or resources, yes, uh, indigenous participants still have a long way to go. But uh, yeah, we're still looking for more avenues or resources to actually go back to our alumni and uh, upgrade their skills in any possible way. Yes, so uh, if, uh, we don't have enough resource, or we think uh, we would be limited by any resource. I think PV is the best way to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope uh, that relates to you. <laughs> to yeah, no, and you. I, I know about Sunflower. Sunflower is also organizing film festivals, and of course, to enter into the film festival, you have to have a certain quality. And and I think you're right, Sitten, that that upgrading the quality of of a film also opens up pathways to larger audiences. Um, but I think Tricia also said that they're working on that by building the grid, using the app, putting, making sure you're on HD quality. And, and so, so there is a, a bridging happening there, but very interesting what you said about uh, a participatory video and, and, and more professional documentary style. And I see in the, in the comments also that, that opens a whole debate around what is actually professional filmmaking eh? and does that have its own uh, uh, language? Interesting, but uh, Kazu, you've had your hand up uh, for a while. So uh, Kazu Ahmed, uh, please go ahead. Maybe you, you'd like to comment on this or you have uh, another question. Go ahead, Kazu. Hi, um, thank you. Um, it's very nice to see everyone here. I don't know anyone, but I know of some of you, and but it feels like a family anyway. Uh, you know, it's so wonderful. Uh, so I have actually, you know, so many interesting things being discussed. It's, I'm so glad. Um, if I may just quickly, before moving on to something else, uh, to say that, you know, how do you exclude, yeah, I mean, documentary filmmaking, participatory video, you know? technicalities versus a lifelong process of learning and implementing things you know i look at participatory video as life lesson as you know a set of life lessons and and you can implement it through very high grade documentary filmmaking um, as well you know so um in 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 some examples i think would be uh, some of the filmmakers that inside share had trained in india uh, that i've been involved with as well and they have gone on to be making uh, award-winning films, you know, good quality award-winning films with, you know, amazing content that have resonated with their societies, with their communities, as well as outside the communities, the larger, um, you know, social work context, um, you know, on issues of climate change and uh, cultural documentation and such. Um, so, but uh, yeah, but anyway, that's, that would, uh, and I think we grappled with this question also recently when we did a training um, in Yangon. So that was one of the things that people, I had to explain to people that, look, you, can, you know, it doesn't have to be naturally, it doesn't have to be exclusive of each other. You can combine both and see what you can do um, and see what fits your needs, you know? So 
<laughs> that, I mean, Andrew, it, award winning is not the goal, but the point is that it was appreciated. I think they they went on to do such amazing work. They, you know, these two women from a village had never touched the camera before, but had within a patriarchal setup had a certain confidence and and acquired certain sets of skills to be so amazing at uh, at what they what they do. Uh, so I think that was very very inspiring. So. Um, uh, but I, I wanted to actually mention something about what Andrew said earlier about you know young people become materialistic, you know, and and uh, they want there is a massive gap between what the a generational gap between what the young people want and what the you know elder generation um, you know sort of uh, what they aspire towards and um, and there is a massive predicament there. How do we actually? How do we deal with that? You know, I mean, of course, like and as Andrew said, you know, you know, they some people, somebody may want um, mobile phones and a, and and, a, and some amount of cash and a motorcycle in some part of the world, and we are no one to say that no, don't do that because that's their aspiration, right? Um, but then you see the other side of the darker side of such aspirations as well. I mean, people have every right to do what they want and what they aspire for, um, but then. You know, there is, uh, we see all these these things. In, I come from India and I see it in my own communities, in my own society. So um, so how do you deal with this is, is a very, very important question. And I think, um, I think what uh, probably one word would be Sitten when he said that, uh, you know, subtly, you know, subtle ways of dealing with this in our own societies or people who we work with. Um, I think this is, there's something more to be explored here. Um, and I think who said, I think, is it, was it, um, was it, was it, hang on, I must say using social media of how you, there are youth using social media, but we kind of, you manage to harness youth and the youth and social media kind of bond and, and manage to, um, you know, uh, enhance your voices, amplify your voices towards a certain goal, if I'm, if I'm not wrong, is that what he said? So, you know, so there could be different ways. And I think we have a lot to learn from um, all our friends who are um, using visual methods or participatory methods um, for various uh, means and ends, you know. So uh, I think it'd be a good one actually to have a very focused discussion on some key aspects of predicaments that we face and how, what kind of experiences we can bring from all over the world to deal with these and how we could do it. Um, I mean, recently we have in Helsinki, we have started talking about uh, how emerging technologies are we can use. I mean, now AI generated stuff is gonna be very big, you know, and how are we gonna be able to deal with this? I mean, we, we go one step into, okay, I'm just about to use my mobile phone. It's like, oh, there is this whole AI thing is coming and I have to go in a run towards that. So how do we keep up with, this uh, rapid expansion of digital advancement, um, and you know, and but and how do we kind of make it useful to uh, to ourselves, you know, and make it easier? Try and bridge some sort of digital gaps if there are any, you know, and and address this. I think I think we have a lot to learn, and I'm sure with the with the um, with the gathering that we have here, we we have a lot to learn from each other, and we can have a we probably have a, we have a lot of lessons. Um, to do this. So I just wanted to quickly sort of flag these issues and say that, you know, some sort of very focused discussion with some key issues or even a set of discussions, you know, saying, okay, this one, we're going to focus on this. And the next one, we're going to have in two months, we're going to focus. I think that'd be very useful. I think it's time we, we did such a thing as a, a community of people working with participatory and visual methods, um, because we're going to have to face it. Uh, we're facing it now and we're going to have to increasingly face it. So um, thank you. That's that's what I wanted to wanted to uh, yeah. say. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kazu. And I think we can facilitate uh, that. Uh, we have everyone's email who joined this session, so we can uh, send an email after the the session. And anybody who would like to join uh, such a discussion, and I see Tricia is also commenting this on on more focused uh, discussions. Uh, we can we can definitely help to facilitate that as uh, as the Video for Change Network. Um, on, on, on whose name we're, we're holding this uh, learning session tonight. 
I also want to be mindful of the time. Uh, we have officially about five more minutes to go. I'm not saying we have to cut it off uh, then, um, but um, just, just being mindful of the time as well. Um, we still have two people with hands raised. Dennis, thank you for uh, the comments in the chat. Um, we'll try first to go to Futa, Futa Koam. Um, go ahead, Futa. Hello, hello everyone. Uh, well, yes, actually I was just trying to add something to what Sitan has mentioned before about the um, blending uh, with the indigenous group that, I mean, the, the leader that she tried to, I mean, protect the island or, uh, with the local authority. Um, it, it actually, as we know that everyone have the right to I mean, to say something to uh, do uh, the protest to protect the, uh, uh, themselves. But uh, like, uh, I'm also to have the, the the leader from the and um, have done because after they arrested, she still like like she's not afraid of the local authority because she feel what she do is right for her people and she not um steal someone else land. It's just uh them that they have been them like been there for so long and before that accident happened, the the another local authority also like give them the permission like the certificate the land certificate to them so that's why that how they have i mean how the the another local authority they have right to to track or to arrest them like to uh, that the land is for the government and back to the 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 media platform that you just mentioned the vod that the um, government like shut it down immediately. I think it's about like politics, political, technical, I, I don't know, I'm just saying, because I feel like after the shutdown, like today and tomorrow, you, the, the prime minister himself, he announced that all of the, the staff there who working uh, at uh, VOD, they can apply for the job at the uh, government um, directly with the, the um, um, department of the staff management, something like that. So I feel like why he make that move if he want to shut them down that because they are the like, I can say they are the um, freedom, how can I say, um, freelance news, something like that. Uh, how, I mean, how can he, he shut them down, like he um, try to avoid any issue and then he just like, oh, come to work with me, something like that. That's what I want to say yeah and and adding to that not many people in Cambodia try to be a uh, influencer for the political because it feel like like you know like you you can die all the time at any time so yeah thank you yeah Thank you so much, uh, Futa, for adding that context to the, the story of, of Sit and, and it, it, it adds more nuance and, and actually makes it also a, a bit more saddening uh, to listen to, to the reality. And I, I, I seem to better understand the, the necessity of having that subtle uh, approach. Um, Yes, we can go on for people that would like to go on. I think officially we were doing the group picture now and, and closing for the record, and then we can just continue on for those who would like to uh, to stay on board. Um, 
but, but thank you, uh, Futa, for that comment. Uh, Jen, we, we, we take a, a, a group picture because eh? we're at time for yes. the documentation and then and then, and then people, people can, to, yes. yeah, people that want to stay on, we'll, we can go on for another half hour or so, or even longer. We just leave the room open, but I, I want to let Jen and, and King go because there, there's other things they also need to attend to. So Jen, can you lead the, the, the group picture and then we'll go back to you, Tricia, for uh, the next bit of conversation. Yeah. Yes, for those who are comfortable to share their videos, let's take a photo. I am not seeing Dennis, Titus, uh, Kennedy, McDonald, Simbuli, um, Jalodi, and Duncan. But it's okay if you're not comfortable to share. I'll take the photo now. Okay, one, two, and three. 